The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. So today I want to talk a little bit about uh, Apache Cloud Stack. This is going to be sort of a very fast overview. Uh, how many folks here have any experience running, managing, or using uh, infrastructure as a service clouds? Okay. How many folks are actually managing one? Not like not just like using AWS, but actually managing an IAS cloud. Okay. Who has really very little understanding of cloud? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. One person. Okay. I like bravery. That's good. All right. Uh, so my name is Joe Brockmeyer. I work for Citrix full time. I am technically an open source cloud computing evangelist. Um, so, you know, at some point I'll pull out the book of cloud and get very emphatic about cloud. Uh, usually just go by PMC member Apache Cloud Stack because I spend pretty much all of my time working on the open source stuff. Uh, so I don't worry about sales and products and things like that. I just want to make sure that the open source project is healthy and thriving and uh, continuing. So let's start by talking about the problem because if you don't have a problem, you don't need a tool. If you don't need a tool, you don't need to be in this room hearing about Apache Cloud Stack, right? So let's talk about what the problem is. The first problem for most enterprise organization is that your apps are very fragile, okay? Uh, you usually have to worry about your, your installs on one or two or three servers, and if they go down, you're toast. So that is one of the biggest problems organizations have. Uh, resources are underutilized. You may have hundreds of servers in your environment or even thousands, uh, but you're probably not picking your resources and you're not using your resources as much as you could be. Some, some organizations have the opposite problem, but usually it's, it's the problem of not using your resources well enough. Provisioning takes a ridiculously long time. How many, like, show of hands, how many people can get an instance, like a server or an application up and running in less than a day? Anybody less than a week? Less than a month? Who takes longer than a month to get an application up? How about just the test dev environment? Six. Six months? Six months. Government? Okay. <laughs> I think we can all agree that it's, it's hard to work in an environment where it takes half a year to provision something, right? So that's obviously a problem. <laughs> Operations is very frequently a bottleneck, okay? Uh, which is also a problem. You do not want to be, how many folks are admins? Okay, do you want to be the bottleneck of the thing that people are frustrated at? No, you do not. And finally, visibility into your usage is usually very limited at best. You don't know what's actually being used and what's not. Remember when virtualization was going to be the savior of IT and everything was going to be wonderful because you could spin up VMs really quick? And then you realize, well, wait, it still takes the network guy six months to give me an IP. And the other thing is, now that you can spin things up very quickly, you do. They just don't get spun down yet. Um, so that's another thing that you want to start using cloud for. So let's talk about what cloud actually is. And by the way, Cloud computing is used as a term for several different types of cloud. What? Oh, I think it'll make Mark very happy to hear that. Um, so let's so let's talk about cloud computing. Uh, NIST has a definition of cloud which I have added to a little bit. And I'll go through this very quickly. First thing is it has to be on demand and self service. Okay, if I can't give you my user credentials or a credit card and have something provisioned within an hour or a few minutes, let's say an hour the first time because you know you got to go to Amazon and type in your address and what the hell is my security code and all that. Um, but otherwise, you need to have things provisioned very quickly, and you have to do it without having to pick up the phone and call someone. You need to have broad network access. If you can't get to your your instances, if you can't get to the resources over the network, obviously it's not cloud or very useful. You need to be pooling your resources, your storage, your network, your compute. You need to be able to pool those and then divide up those resources among different departments or customers, depending on whether we're talking about public cloud or private cloud or, or whatever. 
rapid elasticity. If I can't spin up 100 or 1,000 instances very quickly, or if I can't take them down very quickly, again, it's not really cloud and it's not as useful, okay? Uh, you know, so everybody is familiar with one of the, the biggest use cases in the cloud, look at Netflix. You know, Friday afternoon when everybody gets home and wants to turn on Netflix, they're spinning up instances on Amazon really quickly. And then, you know, Monday morning when everybody got, staggers to work, or most people stagger to work, they can start taking those instances down just as quickly. Measured service, if I can't bill you at the end of the month, uh, if you can't tell how much you're using, or if you can't uh, build the departments at the end of the month, it's not cloud. And then those five are pretty much the NIST definition of cloud. The sixth one is API access, and that's kind of what I've added here, is if I don't have an API to work with it programmatically, it's really not cloud. Um, does anybody need me to go through the cloud service models? Is everybody pretty familiar? Okay. I'm sorry? Yeah, sure. Um, so everybody in here is probably using some form of software as a service. If you're using Gmail or Dropbox or Flickr, uh, one of those things, you're using some software as a service. Salesforce.com, 37 Signals, you know, that's all software as a service. Platform as a service, so things like OpenShift, uh, Active States, uh, I can never remember the name of this. Uh, Sigata, thank you. Um, AppFog. Google App Engine, those are all platform as a service. Basically, I want to write my own application and I want to run it, but I don't want to care about the operating system. I don't want to care about anything under my platform layer, okay? And then what we're discussing today, infrastructure as a service, where basically you are, you're, removing, you're abstracting a lot of the hardware and other things that users don't want to worry about. So things like Amazon Web Services, EC2, uh, things like Google Compute, um, and of course things like OpenStack and CloudStack and Eucalyptus, okay? And by the way, uh, in this presentation, because I'm speaking at a Linux conference, I'm not going to spend, I'll talk a little bit about Apache, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to convince everybody here that open source is important. So is anybody here not convinced about open source? Source. Yeah, <laughs> uh, just just making sure you know. But uh, some of the some of the conferences I go to, it's actually important to talk about why open source is important. I talked uh, in St. Louis a couple weeks ago to a bunch of IT folks from like Boeing and whatnot, and uh, you know they're like, I, I've heard of this commie hippie stuff called open source, but I'm not sure why I would want it in my data center. Um, deployment models. We'll spend a lot of time on this, but obviously. You know, you have your public cloud, things like Amazon, you have private cloud, which is basically everything living behind the firewall, uh, and then the elusive hybrid cloud, which uh, very few organizations are actually doing correctly. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, let's talk about Apache CloudSet. So what is it? Uh, first of all, it is open source. It's under the Apache license, uh, which is probably a no-brainer for you since it has the word Apache in front of it. Um, it is also not just the software that we produce, but it is the community of users and people producing the software, the committers, the PMC members, etc. It is mostly written in Java. I have an asterisk there because we do have some components that are written in Python. We have a fair amount of shell scripting going on. Uh, but for the most part, it is written in Java. Uh, it is a turnkey stack. A lot of folks, you know, want to know what's the difference between Cloud Stack and OpenStack. One of the big differences is that Cloud Stack is sort of productized, and basically, you install Cloud Stack in one fell swoop. Okay, uh, you know, OpenStack is a set of components that you, you sort of mix and match and get the cloud that you want. It's sort of like brambles for the cloud. Um, which is, you know, fine if you want that sort of thing. Um, I can see Robin just losing it like this. Um, anyway, so it is basically intended, it's very opinionated, okay? There's, there's not as much tuning and fussing with to get it up and running. And I'm not trying to say that it's better, uh, you know, uh, what I'm saying is it's just a very different philosophy. It's an opinionated way of saying, you know, let's just do this this way because it works. Uh, it is hypervisor agnostic, and I put an asterisk next, next to that because it isn't comprehensive of all hypervisors, but we don't 
you know, we don't have a preference. If somebody comes to us with the code and write a Hyper-V plugin for CloudStack or something like that, we will take it, okay? Right now, I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about which ones we support, but we support three hypervisors right now. Um, and finally, time-based releases is an important part of the project. We are aiming for a four-month, so every four months we look to put out a release. Very brief history of CloudStack. The project started in about 2008. Uh, it was under a startup, uh, and then they finally came up with some code and released it under the GPL. It came out in 2010 under GPL v3. Um, then the company was acquired by Citrix in July of 2011, and it went. It used to be open core, uh, and it went completely 100% open source in August of 2011. Uh, last year, it was proposed to the ASF as an incubating project. Uh, and if you want to learn everything you wanted to know about uh, how Apache and open source foundations work, come to my talk tomorrow, and I'll talk about those uh, in a lot more detail. Uh, it was accepted into the incubator on April 16th of last year, our first major release. You'll notice there was quite a bit of time between uh, the first release and when we went into the incubator. Uh, first major release was November 6, 2012. The reason for the delay there uh, was basically you have to build a community. You have to go through all the code and you have to, you know, make sure all your licenses and ducks are, are in a row. Um, there's a lot of work to do that isn't, that has nothing to do with the maturity of the code. I should mention, uh, going into the incubator, incubator means nothing in terms of maturity of the code. So when we went in, the code was mature when we went into the Apache incubator. Uh, it's gotten better since then, but you know the incubator is about making sure the project runs as a community. Uh, we had our first minor release in February, uh, and then we graduated from the incubator in March, so not quite one year between going into the incubator and graduating, um, and there was much celebration for that. Uh, and then we released our uh, the latest major version on this week, uh, June 4th, so 4.0 is out. Give it a try, we'll talk about that. Uh, why do we go to Apache? I'll go through this very quickly. One, it's a known and proven governance model, okay? Uh, people have a lot of trust in Apache, whereas they don't necessarily have a lot of trust in a uh, project that is run and dominated by one company. So Citrix made the decision that, you know what, we're gonna get more input from people and more contributions if we are affiliated with Apache as opposed to saying, you know what, just trust us, go ahead and give us your code, it'll be good. So, um, it has active mentoring of new projects, uh, which is very important and very helpful. You get people who have done this several times before, they come in and they watch what you're doing, they offer advice. Uh, it is 100% community driven. So David and I, for example, are Citrix employees, but when we participate in Apache, we do so as individuals, not as employees of Citrix. Okay, and it's a very important distinction. You can't wander into an Apache project and say, well, I work for IBM, damn it, so you have to do things the way that I want to. It doesn't work that way. Uh, the entire Apache Software Foundation has more than 3,000 developers, so there's a lot of talent in that pool to tap into. That doesn't mean we have 3,000 developers working on CloudStack, but it means that you know, there's a much easier way to get in touch with people who have done this stuff before and can be helpful. Uh, and of course, Apache has guided many successful projects. Uh, the Apache project process, I'll talk about very quickly, it's 100% community driven. Uh, one of my favorite things is if it didn't happen on the mailing list, it didn't happen, okay? That means you cannot make major decisions here at a conference when there are five guys and decide this is the way it's gonna be. Uh, well, you can do that, but then people can override it because it didn't happen on the mailing list and there wasn't consensus for it. Okay, uh, and that's extremely important because it puts everybody on a level playing field. We have contributors from Europe, we have contributors from India, we have contributors on both coasts of the United States, we might even have a few folks in Australia. Um, and so the ability for everybody to mull things over on a mailing list as opposed to having to drag their ass out of bed at 4 a.m. Australian time because that's when the IRC meeting is, is very important. Uh, people don't make good decisions at 4 a.m. even if they are willing to get up for the for that IRC meeting. Uh, community over code. A lot of people bristle at Apache processes at first because it's not efficient. 
Okay. Well, I know we're supposed to wait 72 hours for this merge, but damn it, I'm in a hurry. It's not efficient for me to wait 72 hours. You know, it's more important that the community get to look over your code for a major merge than for you to do things more efficiently. And by the way, you're aware of these rules. You might want to, you know, work your schedule around contributing things 72 hours in advance as opposed to, hey, you know, make way for my schedule. Uh, obviously, very rigorous attention to licenses. I was talking about um, Apache at uh, Monktoberfest last year, and I uh, was talking about how rigorous we are with licenses, and somebody in the back that works on Eclipse was just sort of laughing. Uh, they're like, yeah, you, haven't, you, haven't, you don't know rigorous until you've dealt with IBM and licensing. So it, it, it's not as nightmarish as opposed to some organizations, but it's still very, if you get code from Apache, you're pretty damn sure that it's all distributable under the Apache terms. It can seem bureaucratic. There are things that don't always work as well as they could, but for the most part, I think it's a really good way to do open source communities. So let's talk about what CloudStack actually provides. Uh, first of all, it provides its own API as well as an EC2 and S3 API. It provides a self-service portal, it provides metering, um, it provides image management for templates and ISO images for managing instances or for creating instances. Uh, it has a nice dashboard. Identity management, so it will tap into OpenLDAP or Active Directory so that you don't have to create double accounts. Um, it manages load balancing, it manages firewall, it manages your network compute and your storage. Now, it does not provide the storage, for example. You consume the storage, but you, you can use a number of different types of storage, and we'll talk about that. Hypervisor support, currently we support KVM and Zen Server, Zen Cloud Platform, uh, VMware via vCenter, Center, and uh, actually I think Bare Metal is not in the 4.1 release, but I hope it will be back in the 4.2 release. David, do you, on Bare Metal, do you think we're going to have that back in 4.2? Okay, I'll just take that off the slide next time. Uh, but we should, I'm sorry? IPMI. IPMI, yeah. What is that? Uh, um, Something platform management or things. Yeah, it's a internet platform. platform management. Yeah, um, but we should have the next containers in 4.2, so that, that'll be nice. Um, and there is talk, although I don't think I've actually seen code yet for Hyper-V. Which should be interesting because I think they're trying to write that in C sharp. So, uh, CloudStack terminology. I'll go through this really quickly. So everything under CloudStack is a zone, basically. Uh, although now we've introduced region support, so I don't know uh, if we're going to be starting with a region or if that's just extra. Uh, but basically, this is sort of similar to availability zones in. Amazon. Um, it could be worldwide, it could be different data centers. Uh, pod is basically a logical grouping. And then clusters are a group of machines with a common type of hypervisor. This is sort of the, this is where you can move instances back and forth and migrate them to one another. Uh, but they all have to have the same hypervisor, same amount of RAM, CPU, etc. Uh, host is just a single server running one of the hypervisors. And then you have pri primary and secondary storage. Primary is shared across just the cluster. So that's your storage for your instances, those volumes. Uh, and then secondary storage is your shared storage for templates and ISO images and snapshots across the zone. This is sort of a very simplified, basic look at the architecture for CloudStack. You basically just have one or more management servers connected over an L3 core, uh, talking to different uh, pods and so forth. Oh, um, all the hosts in the cluster are going to have access to their shared storage for primary storage. Um, pod is usually a couple, you know, one or more clusters with L2 switches connecting them. Uh, the availability zone has one or more pods. Um, any questions? Yes, sir. How chatty is the relative server? Medium? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 uh, I think gigabit should be sufficient depending on how big your cloud is. Uh, and you can actually, uh, I didn't go into this level of depth, 
you can actually split out the management network and the storage network and things like that. So you basically don't have to worry about production traffic sharing space with the management traffic. Um, so the management server, all of the UI functionality, and I'll show you a screenshot a little bit of that, but all of the UI functionality is available as an API call. There's nothing you can do through the UI that you cannot do through the API. Okay? In fact, there are a few things now that you can do through the API that you cannot do through the UI, like re managing regions at the moment. Um, it is an unauthenticated API for local host if you're just doing testing, but that's off by default. Uh, you do most of your work over an authenticated port 8080, uh, and you get responses back in XML or JSON. Uh, and it basically manages all of your resources in the cloud. So there is one thing to install, it's the management server, uh, and an agent on KVM. But if you're using vSphere and K or XCP or uh, Zen server, there's nothing you need to install. Those are basically supported directly. Do you have a question? 8080 is SSL or uh, it is It is encrypted. Is it really a RESTful API or is it like um, so <laughs> REST like? It's REST like, yeah. They're, they're, um, uh, one of our one of our developers who's a little more academic than, than us is like no it's rest ish you know it's not it is not restful um, but I think there's some work going on to make it more restful so uh, this is the cloud stack UI um, basically it's just very simple to use um, now if you are doing oh sorry what's the minimum number of machines for testing do I have to have the controller on a separate one from the unit? So the absolute minimum is one machine. If you just want to test and you don't want to do anything else and you're not running any kind of production load, the absolute minimum is one machine. For an actual workload, I would say you need to be at least three machines, three or four machines. Um, I would split out, if you were doing just a very small test dev environment, uh, I would have at least two machines so that you can migrate instances if one is about to go down. I would have another machine for storage, uh, and then your management server on a separate machine. Does that make sense? So, um, but you can actually, and I'll talk about this towards the end, you can actually spin up a test instance in VirtualBox with uh, DevCloud, uh, but I would not try to run any kind of production workload in that. Uh, cloud stack storage. So we talked a little bit about this. Primary storage, anything that can be mounted um, on the nodes of the cluster. Uh, you can use cluster LVM, you can use iSCSI. The uh, common denominator is NFS. Uh, I've talked to people who have rigged up a system where they're using NFS mounted on ZFS. So they're basically using like the snapshotting capabilities and things with ZFS and then using NFS just to make it simple. Um, holds the disk images when you're running VMs. Uh, there's also support for CEPH with KVM. Uh, secondary storage is available across the entire zone. Uh, your users can actually share templates with other users across the zone if you allow that, uh, and today you want to make them visible. Um, you can take a snapshot and make it a template. Uh, you can use OpenStack Swift or an object store like LustreFS. Uh, and we have new support for Gringo and 4.0. This is actually a bit of an old slide. Um, and then we're working on storage abstraction and refactoring, uh, which there is a hell of a lot of discussion about right now on the mailing list if you're interested in that sort of thing. Yeah. What is Ceph? Ceph is a distributed storage project, uh, similar but not exactly the same as things like Luster. Um, it's just you know a different implementation. Um, I'm surprised, well, uh, if, you, if you follow storage, you probably heard of it because it's a fairly well-known one. Uh, CloudStack is highly, highly, highly scalable. So this is one of the selling points, is basically it's being used in production, and it's being used in production with people who are uh, well above 30,000 physical nodes, okay? Um, you can usually manage up to 10,000 resources with one management server. Um, we have done testing. Uh, if you want to see more about this in very great depth, Alex Mike has got a presentation that talks about uh, scalability and testing. 
but basically they tested up to 30,000 physical resources and 30,000 instances with just four management server nodes. Now that's you know fairly efficient, and uh, not a lot of environments need more than that. Some do, but not a lot. Allocation, one of the things that I get a lot of questions about is how does Cloud Stack decide where it is going to actually spin up an instance? Uh, and the answer is really it's up to you, okay? Um, you can choose first bit where basically Cloud Stack will just spin up an instance wherever uh, first host responds. Uh, you can do a fill first where basically if you want to save power in your data center, you just fill up the, each machine before you power another one. Uh, or you can do dispersal where you want to spread the load out. So it will specifically look around and make sure that none of the machines are overtasked. If you don't like those, you can actually write your own allocators. Um, you can also do over provisioning so that you can actually, you know, uh, oversubscribe a machine if you don't think everybody's going to use as much RAM or is there a sign and things like that, you can actually overcommit. Um, you also have operating system preference. You can decide, well, I'm going to spin up, and spin up my Windows instances on VMware, but I'm going to spin up all my Linux instances on KVM, and I'm not going to pay for licenses for VMware for those. High availability, we support what's really, really fast mean time to recovery. Okay? Uh, it is not a magical HA solution in and of itself. Okay? Uh, it watches HA uh, available HM or sorry VMs to make sure they're up and spin them back up if they fall over. Um, and also we support redundant routers. So if you turn that on, CloudStack has a software router that will spin up multiple ones so that if one falls over, if the if the machine that the the software router is running on falls over, it will just fail over. Yeah. When you say router, are you thinking like layer two router or uh, we're talking about actual, you know, layer two router. Oh, okay. so. Load balancing, we do use HA proxy, so you can set up load balancing for instances, so you can actually spin up multiple instances and set up load balancing between them. Um, it uses HA proxy. Uh, you can choose between round robin, round robin source or least connection uh, load balancing. Uh, and you can choose the stickiness policy, source, LD cookie, or app cookie. We do support snapshots. Uh, so basically, you can either set these up as recurring snapshots to happen automatically, uh, or you can take them manually. So if you get a system up in a state that you want to preserve, you can manually take a snapshot. Uh, you can delete snapshots if you need to. Uh, you can turn snapshots into templates or volumes that can be used by anybody. So if you have a uh, data volume that you want to share, you can take a snapshot and let other people use it. If you have an image that you have perfect and you want to share it, you can do that. Networking, we support the, basically the whole everything you want, the HTTP, VLAN allocation, firewall, uh, NAT and port forwarding, routing, VPN, and load balancing. Um, we can also manage some physical network hardware uh, if somebody has written a plugin for it, and if, of course, that hardware has an API that we can talk to. Security groups, if VLANs aren't enough for you, and there are a lot of environments where VLANs hit the limitation pretty quickly, we can use security groups instead. Uh, these are layer three isolation. Uh, you have to assume that you're working on a quasi-trusted layer two network, um, and the filtering and isolation will happen at the bridge level using EV tables. Um, and the default, of course, if you're using security groups is to de deny all traffic and you have to poke the holes that you want to allow into your networks. One of the things that, that uh, gets people confused a lot about CloudStack is they want to know how the accounts work because I think they expect some sort of uh, really high, uh, fine-grained role-based access control, which we do not actually have, okay? Uh, we do tap into, like I said, OpenLDAP and Active Directory. But basically, we have three types of accounts. We have admin account for the entire cloud, we have user accounts for the entire cloud, and then we have domain admin or user accounts, okay? So you can create a domain that basically has a set of resources and give someone admin access over that, and they can manage just that set of resources. So for example, if you set up a cloud in your environment and you want to give the developers their own domain to do testing on, you can do that, and they can go ahead and manage it and leave you alone. Um, 
Same thing with you know marketing or whatever. Uh, or if you're running a public cloud, you can let each customer have their own domain. Uh, the account system, really, really simple. Usage accounting, we do not provide billing, but we provide the stats that can be sucked into billing applications. So you can import these into Excel or Ubersmith, or Mista, or Cloud Portal. Uh, we'll show you the VM accounts, CPU usage, basically uh, all the stuff that you want to know about usage in your cloud. <coughs> Excuse me. APIs, the native cloud stack APIs, basically have support for the root admin, domain admin, and user. Uh, they're available over HTTPS, um, and there are Python and Ruby clients available. This is a look at, you probably can't read them terribly well, but this is a look at just some of the APIs that we have. All the ones that have A afterwards are, of course, the admin APIs. So, uh, we do, as I mentioned, have EC2 and S3 compatibility. Uh, you can see uh, Sebastian has put together a couple of presentations on that you might want to take a look at. Uh, so, things like Yuka tools or Bodo should work. Uh, if they do not, it's a bug and you should report it. Uh, there's also a command line tool called Cloud Monkey. Uh, it's basically a shell and a command line tool, so you can use this. It has auto discovery in the API, so basically you can start typing and tab and it will automatically help you figure out what you can, what are supported APIs and arguments. Um, it's Python code built using Marvin, um, and it's available on PyPy, uh, or you can get it with Cloud Stack, but if you're on a machine like, you know, you have a Linux machine or a Mac and you want to just administer your cloud, just use PyPy to install it. I'll talk real quick about some of the use cases that we see. One is private cloud, uh, one is dual workload, uh, private cloud, public cloud, uh, hybrid clouds, and small to very, very large workloads. So, most people are familiar with Zynga and ZCloud, they're using CloudStack for that, where they actually migrate some of their workloads from CloudStack to Amazon Cloud at peak times. Uh, north of 30,000 nodes for them. Datapipe, uh, say ISP that is very distributed, they have a very, they're uh, not using a ton of servers, but they are very geo-distributed. So basically, they're using CloudStack for both coasts of the U.S., Hong Kong, Shanghai, London, and I think they're spinning up Iceland pretty soon. So uh, you can use CloudStack to manage a very distributed cloud as well. Uh, and there's a good presentation on their setup or, or a case study at that URL. And then IS West is a uh, ISP that uses CloudStack. Uh, they're actually using hosted IIS clouds. Okay. Uh, most of their customers are small, they're using a mix of hypervisors, but they have functioning cloud in production, selling things to people in a little over a month. So that is, you know, that's pretty speedy for this sort of thing. Let's talk about trying cloud stack. Uh, so as I was mentioning before, uh, dev cloud is a virtual box image with nested virtualization. Uh, you can grab it on our, get the URL from our wiki. Uh, you just pop it up in a virtual box and you can shell in or uh, log in via the GUI and go. It's very, it's used a lot by our developers. It is not something that you want to use for any kind of production. Not even, like, I want to personally play around with VMs. It's very slow, okay? Um, there's also DevCloud KVM, which is an effort to basically use DevCloud uh, just on a single box with KVM. And then CloudStack Runbook, uh, if you want to get up and running pretty quickly. What is the status statement of the Runbook right now? Is it up to date for 4.1? It is not up to date for 4.1. No. It's up to date for about 50 different Okay. Um, so, probably needs a little bit of work, but not tons for uh, 4.1. But it's basically, uh, the CloudStack guides are trying to explain how you can set up the cloud using multiple hypervisors, multiple operating systems, basically all the available options. The idea of the runbook is to have something that's opinionated and basically says, you know, I'm just gonna tell you one path that we know works. So uh, that's what the runbook is for. 
Um, so direction, we're currently on a time-based release cycle. Uh, hitting a four-month release cycle is a little tricky, so we're still getting the bugs ironed out. Um, we just released 410. We will be releasing 420 in September, we hope. Uh, 411 is expected in the next few weeks. There were a few bugs that we caught after 410 was out. Uh, how many folks know how Apache works on releases, like how releases happen? So I'll describe that real quick. Basically, um, Apache has a voting process for releases. So basically, you have to put in the um, artifacts, and basically everybody's supposed to test them and vote. And you're supposed to test them for functionality, but also for you know license righteousness and things like that. Um, so basically, once a vote is underway, if you find a minor bug or something, it's usually more of a pain to stop the vote, fix the bug, and respin and start from scratch. So basically, we decided to go ahead with 410. We took uh, the source release is the only official release. So actually, we have some fixes that are in the unofficial binary releases, the RPMs and Debian packages, that are not in the source release. Uh, so that a lot of people just consume the packages. Um, how we do support? So once we release 410, we stop supporting 40, and we focus on 410, and it'll get the point releases until 42 comes out. And the way that 41, 42, 43, etc. work is we'll stay on that branch or that you know that uh, version until we hit major API changes or some major architectural change that is backwards incompatible, and then we would go ahead and, and bump that up. And once we do that, once we start with a 500, we will support the last four or whatever release for about 12 months. Okay, maybe longer, but at least 12 months. Any questions on that? How painful is it upgrading between releases? Um, it is currently, depends on whether you're upgrading. So we, we're actually trying to support releases that came out before the Apache project existed. And we have people trying to update from like 2.2 something to 4.0, and that's a little painful. Um, if you're trying, you, it should be not at all painful if you start on like 4.0 to go from 4.0 to 4.1, from 4.1 to 4.2. Uh, but we're working on making it as painless as humanly possible. We do, it's very important to us that upgrades are supported. Very, very, very important. Uh, some of the things that are new in 4.1, auto scales, so we work with load balances like the Netscaler uh, to scale resources up and down. Uh, we resize volumes for instances, which is new. Uh, we have open switch support for KVM. Uh, we had it in, in Zen before, but not in, in, not in KVM. Uh, API request throttling, so people can't DOS your cloud instance by sending too many requests. AWS like regions, that's supported via the API only right now. Uh, and persistent networks. So basically, you can claim a network spot without actually having any instances running. You couldn't do that before. Uh, and so I'm going to talk. So we started to talk off, or I started to talk off, basically with you know what problem are we trying to solve? So now we talked about all the features that are in Apache Cloud Stack, um, but I want to talk about basically you know you need to do things right or you're not going to be very successful. Cloud is not like magical pixie dust, okay? Um, you have a couple types of workloads, and most people are used to the cattle or the, the pets type of workload, okay? You have an SAP running in your uh, data center, for example, okay? That's your pet. You're not going to let SAP die, okay? If something happens and it falls over, you're going to worry about it. If some of your cattle get hoof and mouth, you shoot them in the head, and you buy new cattle. Okay, or you, you breed some more cattle. Um, that's the cloud workload. You want to get, basically get to the point where if the workload is misbehaving, you shoot it in the head and you spin up another instance. Okay, I'm not going to shoot my cat in the head, so uh, you know, but I will have a hamburger now and again. You know, um, so um, private cloud means, uh, and I. I the talk I did in St. Louis a couple weeks ago, I was doing with somebody from Eucalyptus, and he said, you know, we're seeing a lot of people who want AWS behind their firewall, but they have never managed the data center before. <laughs> and so they thought they were going to get AWS by just installing Eucalyptus, but they don't know how to manage a data center. 
Um, you still have to be able to manage the data center to run an IIS cloud. Uh, your new applications have to be architected for the cloud to be useful. Now, CloudStack is really good for some for dual workloads. You know, if you have uh, some stuff running in VMware, for example, and you want to be able to manage it a little bit easier while you're writing new applications in the cloud, CloudStack is ideal for that. But you're not going to get the same cloud benefits by forklifting an application into, into CloudStack. Okay? Um, you require competence with other tool sets. CloudStack alone isn't going to get you there if you don't know Puppet, if you don't have monitoring, if you don't have uh, Jenkins, continuous integration, things like that. You're still not going to get the real benefits of cloud. If you look at, if you go look at Netsc uh, Netflix and talk to them about their applications, it's not just AWS. They're using a whole lot of different stuff to get where they're at, uh, and it requires a cultural shift in a lot of organizations. Okay. Um, I like to make an appeal in every presentation for people to get involved. First, first step is go to cloudstack.org or cloudstackapache.org uh, and look over the source code, or you know, look over the documentation, download the source code. Uh, if you have questions, we have a very active group of users in CloudStack and CloudStack-Dev. So if you have usage questions, pop into IRC and ask. We'll try to help. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, by the way, I love it when people tweet about the presentations. So if you are a Twitter person, well, we love that. Uh, you will find a lot of presentations on more specific topics on SlideShare. Uh, and then mailing lists. Uh, everything happens on the mailing list. Uh, if you subscribe to Dev, I strongly recommend setting up a filter and putting it in a folder because it is a fire hose. Uh, we have like 5,000 messages in, jo in January. Yeah, it's not LKML, but it's still pretty, pretty active. Uh, this is, by the way, a picture of uh, some of our developer community at the last CloudStack conference. We're doing another one at the end of June. Uh, if anybody uh, feels like visiting Santa Clara, beautiful Santa Clara, uh, we will be doing that June 23rd through 25th. Um, and it is inexpensive, and we will be taking people to uh, Great America for one evening. Uh, Gene Kim will be there to speak about the Phoenix Project, which if you're doing IT today and you have not read the Phoenix Project yet, I strongly recommend that you grab it. It's a very quick read. It's very, uh, it's a novelized, how many people have read the goal or have heard of it? I know you have it. Um, okay, it's basically a business process book, but it doesn't read like a business process book. It's novelized, it's somewhat entertaining. And you can read it if you are, you know, if you can read with any frequency, you can read it in like a day. So, the Phoenix Project. So, what was the goal? The goal was, uh, I think it's Eli something. Uh, basically, it was early 80s, and it was about uh, fixing production, you know, fixing uh, manufacturing. Uh, so, this, the, the Phoenix Project takes after that. Uh, it's just fixing IT as opposed to uh, manufacturing. So, you know. What's that? Yeah. yeah. Which I enjoyed reading that because I actually worked in a car seat factory for three and a half years. <laughs> uh, and so reading that, uh, you know, it was nice seeing the factory I worked in was actually not bad. They had learned a lot. Um, this was in the early 90s, but I can see some of where the bottlenecks were and, and where um, where they could have made things a lot better. So, of course, the plant was now shut down. It was dependent on Chrysler and St. Louis, which went away. So, not much can help you if you're in that situation. Any other questions? I'll put my contact information up here. Um, you know, I usually talk about putting the slide share, slides up on SlideShare or whatever, but uh, at this point, the NSA probably has my slides, just send them a request. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, I will have these up on SlideShare, I, I will tweet them like later. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there you go. Yeah, the Associated Press, that's my blog. I've had that. <laughs> 
for like is oh yeah that's the URL shortcut. It's a it's a sort of it's a much more friendly URL shortcut. So. All right, other questions? All right, I will. Uh, I thank you for your time and. Uh, Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.
Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use. 
giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked.